first of all, we will talk about the basic information carrier in quantum computation, the qubit. The qubit is the simplest quantum system that you can imagine. It's a quantum system in two-dimensional Hilbert space. So that's the smallest non-trivial Hilbert space um, that you can think of. And like in every Hilbert space, you have, uh, you have a basis or you can define a basis. And already thinking of the future application in quantum computing, the standard notation for the basis is zero and one. Yeah, so these are orthogonal normalized basis states in our two-dimensional Hilbert space. Now an arbitrary pure state in this two-dimensional Hilbert space can be written as a superposition of these two basis states. Yeah? So pure state of this uh, qubit in this two-dimensional Hilbert space is, um, is a superposition of these two basis states. Of course, the coefficients, the amplitudes, um, have to satisfy the normalization condition. So we have the sum of the absolute values squared must be equal to one. Now we can make a special choice or some special assumptions. First of all, we, you know that um, when you describe a pure state with the unit vector, the global phase is irrelevant. So we can always um, factor out a global phase and this will not change the pure state. So for example, if the um, first coefficient alpha naught, this is a complex number and um, you can always write it as the absolute value of alpha naught times a phase factor. Yeah? That's the exponential representation of a complex number. So it's times e to, to the i phi naught, for example. Yeah? And since global phases are relevant, you can factor out this um, phase factor, e to the i phi naught, and then you have the absolute value of alpha naught times basis vector zero. And then you have alpha one and then e to the minus i phi zero times basis vector one. Now, likewise, the coefficient alpha one has an exponential representation. So that's the absolute value of alpha one times some phase e to the i by one, let's say. Yeah. And now we say, okay, this, this global phase factor in front of the round bracket, that's irrelevant. So let's forget about it. And we just write the um, pure state as absolute value of alpha zero um, times basis vector zero plus absolute value of alpha one. And then we get a relative phase factor. So that's e to the i phi one minus phi zero times basis vector one. And so up to a global phase, we can always write the pure state of a qubit in this form. We know this absolute value of alpha one is somewhere in the interval between zero and one. 
And so is the absolute value of alpha one. It's also somewhere between zero and one. In fact, we know from the normalization condition above that the sum of the absolute value squared must be equal to one. And then uh, this phase factor, we can all write as e to the i phi. Yeah? So difference of phi one and phi zero, we call that phi. Now look at these absolute values of alpha zero and alpha one. They are both in the interval between zero and one. They are real. Um, and the sum of the squares is equal to one. This suggests a, a way to parameterize these absolute values. We can say, we can parameterize the absolute value of alpha zero as the cosine of some angle theta over two. The cosine is real and the cosine for angles, for angles between zero and pi, the cosine of theta half is between zero and one. Yeah? So, and it's um, the cosine in that, on that domain is a monotonically decreasing function. So the map between the absolute value of alpha zero and the, co and the angle theta is one to one. Yeah? So it's invertible. Now, um, the absolute value of alpha one is also real. And remember the normalization condition, the sum of the absolute values squared um, is equal to one. Now, if we express the first coefficient as the cosine, as a cosine, um, then the second coefficient, this, this real factor must be the sine of theta over two because cosine squared plus sine squared is always equal to one for any angle. And um, also the sine, if, if the angle is in the interval between zero and pi, the sine of theta half is always in, in, the, in the interval between zero and one. Yeah? So that also fits. And then we have still the relative phase factor e to the i phi times basis vector one. So this uh, was meant to show that up to a global phase factor, which is physically irrelevant, the pure state of a qubit can always be written in this form. It can always be parameterized with two angles, theta between zero and pi, um, which appears in the cosine and the sine, and another angle phi, which is somewhere between zero and two pi. Okay. Now let's get back to the slide. This is precisely what I just um, showed you on the notepad that you can always write a pure state of a qubit in this particular form. Now this suggests, you have two angles, theta and phi. This suggests that you can represent the pure state of a qubit graphically as a point on the surface of a sphere. Let me show you how that works. Uh, so let's take a point on the surface of the sphere. And this point is uniquely specified by two angles. You have an angle with respect to the z-axis, uh, the angle of theta, and this angle has a range between zero and pi. And then you have another angle 
um, in the xy plane, an angle phi, and this has a range from 0 to 2 pi. These are precisely the angles that you use in spherical coordinates. Yeah, in spherical coordinates, you have, uh, you have these two angles and you have the radius. Now here we don't have the radius, we fix the radius of that sphere to be equal to 1, so it's a unit sphere. And then each point on the surface of this unit sphere is um, specified by these two angles, theta and, and phi, yeah? just like in spherical coordinates. And this sphere, um, we will use the sphere a lot to, to visualize operations, observables in, uh, for a qubit. Um, and so this is a very useful picture and it's called the Bloch sphere or sometimes in quantum optics it's also known as the Poincaré sphere. Yeah? And so you can, you can visualize the pure state of a qubit always as a point on the surface of this Bloch sphere. Now where on this Bloch sphere are the, the two basis states, zero and one? Um, in order to get the, look at the, the form of a general pure state, in order to get the basis state zero, the cosine has to be one and the sine has to be zero. I'm sorry, I have uh, a question. Yes. What is the meaning of the vector that is positioned by the angle of, uh, of phi? The oh, this, vector. This vector in the xy plane. Yeah. Um, that's the, um, when you project the, the unit vector that points to the state psi, when you project that orthogonally onto the xy plane, then you get the vector down there. It's like in spherical coordinates, it's the same idea. Um, and so also when you have a, a point in space, and then in order to get this spherical coordinate phi, you project it onto the xy plane. Okay. Yeah. So the, um, where's the basis state zero? The, the cosine has to be one and the sine has to be zero. The cosine is one if the argument is zero. So when theta is equal to zero, then the cosine is, is one and the sine is zero. So the basis state one then corresponds to the, to the north pole of the Bloch sphere. Uh, when theta is equal to zero. And the other basis state one, um, we get the other basis state when the, the cosine vanishes and the sine is equal to one. Now we know the cosine of pi over two uh, vanishes and the sine of uh, pi half is equal to one. So we get the basis state one when the when the angle theta is equal to pi and that's precisely the south pole of the Bloch sphere and um, you notice that the uh, two basis states are at opposite ends uh, they're called anti antipodes they are antipodal uh, so they're on opposite sides of the sphere and basis states are always orthogonal. And that's not a coincidence. If you take an, uh, an arbitrary pair of states, which are orthogonal to each other, then graphically on the Bloch sphere, they correspond to antipodes. Yeah? So another example are the two states uh, on the x-axis, which I called plus and minus, the plus and the minus states. And um, they are also orthogonal to each other. Um, the plus state corresponds to the angle theta equal to pi over two and uh, phi equal to zero. And let's see what happens when we insert this in the general formula for the pure state. Then we get cosine of pi over four, the cosine of pi over four, that's one over square root of two. 
And the sine of pi over four is also one over square root of two. And the relative phase factor is equal to one. So we get one over square root of two, and then in brackets, basis state zero plus basis state one. And that's precisely the formula that you see on the left-hand side for the plus state. For the minus state, um, it's the same value for theta, but phi is equal to pi. And then you get the relative phase factor e to the i pi, and this is minus one. And therefore, in the round bracket, you get basis state zero minus basis state one. And you also see that in the formula on the left-hand side. And these are two states which also feature often in quantum computation. Yeah, so we'll encounter that a lot. And you can easily check that these two states are also orthogonal to each other. So they also constitute a basis. They, they, they are an alternative rotated basis in, in two-dimensional Hilbert space. And graphically on the Bloch sphere, they are also on opposite sides. They are also antipodal states. 